All right. <laughs> And in three, two, one. Hello and welcome to another episode of the Real Investment Property Income Podcast. My name is Jeff Eady. Joining me today, as always, one of Canada's top mortgage brokers, the starlight on my otherwise gloomy night, Mr. Jonathan Tilger. Jonathan, how are you today? I'm doing phenomenal, Jeff. And yourself? I am fantastic. I am uh, overjoyed. We had to press record because uh, Jonathan just got into the conversation way too fast with this gentleman. Uh, I have his intro up and, uh, you know, I don't do well at reading these, but I'm going to do my best. He is a seasoned real estate and cryptocurrency hedge fund manager who doesn't just help people uh, protect people's wealth. He's actively protected three different U.S. presidents while serving on a Marine presidential security force for a top secret facility and departments of the uh, and Department of the White House. He now focuses on serving investors through alternative uh, asset classes like blockchain technology, cryptocurrency, and specific sectors of real estate. Zach serves as the VP of Investor Relations for Boron Capital's Family of Investment Funds, whose team have created triple digit returns consistently out and consistently outpaced Bitcoin. Cool. Uh, today, I'm, I am excited to pick his brain and give uh, and, and have the inside track on how to successfully produce strong returns in cryptocurrency and in develop uh, cryptocurrency investments. I told you I don't do well at, uh, at, at saying these things. Please welcome VP of uh, sorry, VP of Investor Relations for Boron Jeez, oh, for Boron Capital, you're good, family man. You're good. Funds. Mr. Zach <laughs> Morrow. Zach, me. how are you today? You're I'm so sorry, good, man. <laughs> Jeff, I'm excited to be with you guys, Jonathan. Um, I know this is going to be a, a fun, fun show today, and so looking forward to uh, figuring out every every direction it goes. So, so before Jonathan asks his question, something is always very important to me. Thank you very much for your service. Amen. You're very welcome. I appreciate that. Thank you. That's uh, that's huge. Jonathan, go ahead. No, oh, I mean, when we jump on here, I mean, most of you are not seeing video, but we're seeing video as we're talking. And I'm looking behind you on the wall and I see what looks to be a musical instrument and looks to be, I mean, I'm only seeing part of it, but it looks like it may be a gold record or something along those lines. So do you have a music background as well? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I, I wish, right? Um, my wife and I are both... Um, avid uh, music listeners last night when we were talking she's like I feel like I feel like I've missed my calling I think I was supposed to be in music and I'm like really I'm like well it's not too late and she's like it's probably too late I'm like it's not too late but um no actually oddly enough you know I get I, I I'm gonna have to put start putting labels but this right over here is my right shoulder my left uh, my right shoulder here that's actually a paddle and okay. that was a departing gift okay um, <laughs> upon leaving my military station and so it's a paddle that has um i can grab it but for those who are on video um it essentially uh was presented oh, cool. to me by the department of the white house i was with and um you know covers uh, my service there so this is obviously a marine corps emblem here and then this over here uh is a presidential support badge for a position in direct support of the president Very so that's cool. what this is um over my other shoulder I might not be able to hang this back up, but <laughs> there we go. On my other shoulder, this is actually an award, and it looks like some sort of uh, platinum record. Um, <laughs> this is actually an award for um, a uh, through a marketing community I'm a part of, and um, that's for uh, passing eight figures in business uh, through um, online. Oh, oh wow! Well, congratulations on that. Yeah. Okay. Uh, <laughs> let's unpack that. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I'll tell you, question, it's, it's all related back to the other stuff, right? I mean, everything we do, um, you know, we really focus on building good businesses and then we, you know, create investments around those. So, you know, on the real estate side, we're really going out and finding real estate that has a quality operational component to it. We love the underlying value collateral and things like that for good tangible real estate. But then for us, we really want to be able to influence the outcomes of anything we're investing into, um, at least to the highest degree that we're able to, right? And so for us, you know, that that comes with some form of commercial uh, component. You know, right now, our primary focus of expansion is self-storage mobile home communities. But historically, I mean, we've done, you know, we've done multifamily. We've been in special purpose like corporate housing, uh, wedding event venue, things like that. And um, all those have an operational component that allows us to be able to better control the outcomes. And so, you know, whenever you're going to be putting dollars to work, and especially when investors are trusting you to do so, you want to be able to have as much control over 
your outcomes as possible. And so, you know, that that's part of the, the process there. Okay. So uh, can we, uh, sorry, let's back that up as a hedge fund. You're not investing directly in the asset, uh, the, the land itself, you're investing in the business. So um, it's, it, from a, from a fund perspective on the real estate side, we're actually owning the property and the okay. operations of that property, right? So, you know, in certain cases, you might see other funds who are going to go and they might invest into, uh, you know, a portfolio or things like that. And then they bring on operations. They might bring on third-party management, things like that. I'm just saying that historically, we've had a, a more vertical integration where the operations are managed in-house, right? Or we have, we're partnered um, like right now with the self-storage mobile home communities, uh, one of our partners is actually, you know, one of the largest managers um, of self-storage mobile home communities in the nation. And so, you know, while they are in, in theory, third party, because you have a relationship with them and it's a separate company, um, they're actually partnered on the deal. So, you know, it allows some additional benefits of, you know, knowing exactly who's doing it, who's managing it and being a lot closer to the, to the operations. Having your team. <laughs> yes you got to have your team um right. and 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 what kind of sorry what uh size do you look for when it comes to a deal so right now i'll tell you as far as like you know self-storage we're talking money size Capital right? wise, yeah 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 so so typically right now you're looking at anything from you know i'd say you know 10 million to 35 40 million okay and what's, what's your process? What's, Sorry, go ahead, Jonathan. <laughs> I was going to ask along the same lines as you. If you're asking process. I was just going to ask about time, time frame and, and the time frame that you're generally looking to hold these assets for, or is it just you hold them indefinitely? What, what, what's kind of the, the thought yeah. between, I mean, Jeff's saying process, but just your exit, your entry, exit, and those types of things and evaluating uh, an investment? Yeah. So, you know, historically, I'll tell you, the company's been in business. We're about to have our 16th anniversary. So 16 years in business. And, and over that 16 years, there's obviously been, you know, a variety of different things we've been involved in. And there's been different structures uh, throughout that history. You know, some things, you know, when the company first got started, uh, they were really doing everything internally, no real outside investors. And then, you know, then it kind of went to the syndication route, you know, a couple, you know, private partnerships, you know, with outside investors, then syndicating for individual assets. And then, you know, over the last few years, we've really been transitioning into funds specifically. And, you know, presently, you know, our whole time is dictated based off of, you know, the type of fund we're trying to create. So every fund is going to have a strategy based off of, you know, their expertise and um, their ability to navigate based off of economic influences surrounding you know, the present time. So years ago, we did have, you know, the shorter term holds, we did do, you know, a six month hold on some things where we're building it up, flipping, we have, you know, three year holds in multifamily, things like that. But really, for us now, um, on the real estate side, we're really focused on asset accumulation. And so we're focused on longer term holds. And um, that longer term hold, you know, we identified as 10 plus years. And, um, you know, to run a model like this, you have to do it just a little bit different, because, you know, in almost every investment, when you work with the investors, one of their first questions is like, well, how do I get my money back? What's the exit plan? You know, when am I going to get my capital back? Right. And so, you know, with a, with a, with a value add or something shorter term, obviously, you know, a clear defined exit is, is um, a pretty easy way to say, well, once we execute on this plan, this strategy, we'll have a disposition, sell the property upon disposition, you know, you'd recoup, you know, whatever capital is owed to you. And then, um, you know, any, any profits and return from there. So for us right now on the real estate side, with us having a longer term hold, we actually focus on return of capital first. So when an investor comes in, all distributions on the front side are all return of capital. So number one, that allows the investors to get all their money back. We do a preferred rate on that at 8%. And then um, once their money is back, we allow them to retain all of their equity ownership for the life of the investment. So they continue to profit and benefit and share in the upside of everything from there. Now, as far as like return of capital, like I said, number one, you get your money back. Number two is you're, you're able to begin getting distributions and return of capital is non-taxable. So investors like having dollars coming back into their pocket that they don't have to pay taxes on. No doubt. <laughs> that's, uh, that's a great way of structuring it. It's almost like a pref uh, pref share, but you don't have to uh, pay on the capital gains. Right. So it, it is very similar. The difference is, is, you know, accounting more or less, right? And so some people 
you know, that's always the, the long part of the conversation is, you know, the difference between the dollars and cents and the accounting of the dollars and cents. So yeah, it is return of capital. You know, we have a target time frame of when we want to return the capital within a, a certain time frame, And then from there, continue to, you know, grow and manage these operations and continue to operate the portfolio. So how did you, uh, how did you get started in this business? Well, um, I originally got started uh, through the owner of Boron Capital. Whenever I left the Marine Corps, you know, I was kind of at this point of, okay, you know, I have the sort of entrepreneurial bug. I wanted to, you know, obviously have more financial freedom, more time freedom, which is something that I think um, uh, any service member is looking for after, <laughs> after they, they exit, right? <laughs> you've, had, you've had almost every, every waking hour and, uh, and sleeping hour managed for many, many years, right? And, um, you know, especially with my job, uh, when I went, when I went into the Marine Corps, um, I was not married. And so, you know, the, the account for my time was, was, I didn't hold it as in high regard. Cause you know, Hey, let's, let's do it. Whatever we got to do, you know, we get the job done, whatever hours we got to work and it didn't impact anyone, but me. And I was there for it, but, um, ended up getting married about halfway through, um, my term of service, um, had a, had a daughter together and uh, started the family. And, and that really kind of started shifting the way I looked at uh, at, at things. And so whenever I was leaving and transitioning out of the Marine Corps, um, you know, I, we, I had graduated in West Texas in this area is where my wife and her family were from. My parents were here. We're starting the family. So we came back here. I, I started going to Texas tech and, um, started, uh, working full-time, going to school full-time and then, uh, working on opening a business. And so I was actually, you know, in the Marine Corps, I worked, um, primarily with physical readiness, Marine Corps martial arts and things like that. So I just took that skill set and was applying it into the world. You know, I, I began uh, building a fitness business, building a full service gym and started uh, getting into uh, owning and operating a training facility and, you know, full service gym. And so that was my first exposure into the actual business world. And so over the next few years, <clears throat> as I was continuing to learn how to actually be a business owner and operator, you know, I, um, I am a... I'm sort of an obsessive studier. So I like learning new things. I'm a very curious person by nature. And so, you know, I really dove in deep to like business management and operations and things like that. And I realized that, you know, running the business is significantly, significantly different than having the skill set to be the operator. Right. And, um, you know, you're learning that while you're doing it. So obviously, you know, hard lessons along the way, but um, eventually um, had got introduced to Blake Templeton, who owns Boron Capital and had founded it. And, um, he actually started using the facility. We became friends. We were working together and seeing each other on a regular basis. He actually came on and um, at a certain point, uh, as our relationship grew, he came on and was mentoring and consulting me from business operations. And so it was probably uh, close to two or three years that we were more or less working together. And I was learning business operations from him, uh, operating my own things before I actually ended up selling what I was doing. Because, you know, at a certain point, the conversation became, what do you think about, you know, coming over and joining the team over here. And it's like, well, I'm doing, doing my own thing over here. What, you know, how does that look? So it, it, obviously that's a, that's a you know, longer story, but ultimately that's what happened. That conversation happened and, um, you know, made the process. I had dispositions of what I was, you know, operating over there and then um, came over and joined the team here. And so, you know, I've been with the company now for uh, starting 2017. So coming up on five years. And wow. so that, that was kind of the, the condensed version, but yeah. So there's a couple of things about that that I, I love. So you didn't have a background in real estate or cryptocurrency at the time. No. Um, and I, I definitely want to understand how, how that learning process went, because that sounds yeah. interesting. Um, <laughs> but I, I also love it that that um, Blake recognized talent without the skill. Um, John Maxwell is a big fan of saying that you don't hire people and teach them to be nice. You hire nice people. Yeah. So what yeah. was what was the on the job uh, uh, throw them to the lions kind of training like? Well, so you know I'm very much whenever I'm processing I'm looking for character and ability to actually uh, process on the job. So on the job on the job when, when I at least my my interpretation of what John Maxwell is saying is he's processing character traits mm -hmm. and he's looking for the character traits that are going to have you know kind of unanimous uh, point throughout. And so that's been that's been something that obviously is foundational to building any team, I believe is focusing on character traits first and then understanding the skill set. And then from, from a position, um, understanding 
specifics of the job are important depending on the different roles that are that are taking place. Some of it can be trained and some of it um, can't be trained, right? Mm -hmm. And so for me, whenever I came over on the investor relations side, really what I was what I was helping do was 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 build up and work with people. And I'd been working with people day in and day out, you know, for, for many, many years. So even, you know, at 18 years old in the Marine Corps, I was with, you know, high level diplomats, you know, with matters of national security. And so, you know, I've, I've been operating around people, um, you know, for, for at least the decade prior to that and uh, servicing people. And so, you know, I came on to help on in that aspect and then was brought into from there, learning all the aspects of actually the investor management, the investor process, and then understanding how um, the business itself works. So even today, I'm not the operator of the real estate. So, you know, on the day-to-day -day operations, we have people that are on site that are high specialty inside of those spaces, right? Mm -hmm. But for, for me specifically, you know, I believe I was hired one because of the level of trust that he had in me, um, what he had seen as far as my disciplines, my ability, and um, I think probably a desire that um, demonstrates it will always, you know, rise to the occasion. And so, um, you know, that's and kind of leading to probably what your next point is, like the real estate side, things like that. Blake and the and the, the other people on the team, they'd been working in real estate for over a decade, right? So it wasn't that they needed me to come be the real estate guy. They needed me to come help manage a certain department inside the space. And then now as it's grown, you know, obviously I've been intricately involved in all aspects, you know, really since then. And so, you know, understanding and applying that knowledge is something that, you know, grows just by virtue of uh, being in this position and continuing to learn. But then, um, you know, the transition obviously into crypto, that the company didn't start there. So, you know, for us, we're always asking the question of who and not how. And um, that really comes down to what I mean by that is finding the people who are experts in the thing you're looking to grow and scale in. Mm -hmm. And so how do you add to the team? Who do you need to add to the team to help fill in any potential deficiencies or to help build the strongest team, right? You know, whenever, whenever you're putting together anything, um, you're always wanting to bring the right people and the right skill set. So, you know, just on the, even, even on the real estate side, there's, there's deals that we are partnering with other people on, right? Who maybe have more specialty in a specific area. On the crypto side, same thing. When we knew we wanted to be in the asset class, we start asking the question, like, who are the experts in this asset class and how can we align with them, partner with them, learn from them, or, you know, create a relationship with them to, act, to be able to bring the best product or service, you know, to, to our people. And so, you know, that's really what our focus is on is, is finding the right people that not only have the character traits, but then, you know, grabbing the people as far as expertise and the immediate skill set that you're needing for the role. Um, did you see any investor pushback when you started the, to diversify specialties? Um, you, you mean from like real estate to crypto? Yeah. So interestingly enough, man, um, I've had, I've had responses across the entire board, right? <laughs> um, some people, you know, um, that have been around us for many, many years are like, what are we doing here? And then, it, then it's a conversation of understanding, you know, why we're getting into these asset classes, what we believe in. But at the same time, not every investor, like our, our funds are not integrated where one impacts the other, mm -hmm. right? So if, you know, if John Smith is invested into self-storage and mobile home communities with inside a specific fund, uh, the operations of that fund are completely separate than any operations we would be doing elsewhere. So they would have a decision whether or not they wanted exposure into one or the other into, or into both and things like that. So, you know, I, I haven't had a lot of pushback, uh, to be honest. I've had people going, okay, you got to explain this to me because to me, it seems like I had one guy, he's like, this just seems like unregulated voodoo. And I'm like, <laughs> I'm like perfect, perfect. This is great, um, you know? So, you know, and then you've got others that have been like, all of a sudden you found out, you know, you know, Bob Jones over here has been holding Bitcoin for five years, you know, and he's like, oh, this is awesome. You know, and then he's like, you know, I want to meet, you know, who's on the team, you know, what are you guys doing here? So um, I would tell you, it is the highest level of curiosity we've ever experienced. You know, everybody's extremely interested, even though their initial response may be it's unregulated, unregulated view voodoo, or they're saying, you know, what the hell is Bitcoin, you know? So, um, yeah, but as well, far as, you know, overall pushback, 
there, there, just, there hasn't been too much, no. Just overall with, with the crypto world, because as you say, it's something that really, I'll say the last sort of five, six years, it's gone from being, I mean, I know it was kind of about 10 years ago when it kind of started, but it's really five, six years, it's been, it's gone from being like, suddenly it's, it's become mainstream. Everyone's talking about it. Everyone's seeing, well, what's the value of Bitcoin today? Sure. How do you, I mean, how would somebody who wants to get in on that, how would they find out and even find a reputable way to, to invest in it? Because there's so many different platforms out there. Obviously, I know this gives you a chance to plug your, yourselves as well right here. <laughs> <For> uh, sure. <laughs> which, which is part of it. But, but just in general, I mean, you see all these different wallets, all these different things you can get and going, well, where does the money go? What's happening to it? Is that a place where they're going to disappear overnight? Because it is kind of unregulated, but at the same time, it's becoming more regulated and becoming a lot more mainstream. So it's not voodoo. Yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, just to, you know, the initial thing is 100% not voodoo. I mean, it's, it's absolutely real tangible product. Is there a lot of crap out there? hundred percent. Right. So I'll, I wouldn't even, you know, you, you just, I'd be ran off the air if I said, Oh, it's all good. No, it's not all good. <laughs> There's a lot of crap. So you have to know how to cipher the crap. And so what I really hear you saying is how does somebody navigate, you know, what's good and what's not, yeah. um, you know, we years ago, it wasn't until 2020 that we actually took it serious as an, as, an investable asset class. So, you know, for, from our side, that's when we really, um, were on the radar of, we had, you know, personally done some things and been watching it, but as far as like, you know, taking this to market and being able to put together a fund and things like that, I mean, there's not a lot of precedent for it. And so, you know, navigating the waters for that, um, was, was something that took a lot of time and, um, obviously a lot of, you know, structure and setup and things like that, uh, putting the team together, but, um, you know, for anybody that's looking to do it on their own, it takes a lot of research. It is, it is difficult to know what is and what isn't, you know, as far as like factors you're looking for, I'll just tell you, like for us, we're always processing number one, you know, um, the understanding of what Bitcoin is versus the rest of the market. I'll just tell you, it's completely different. You know, Bitcoin is truly decentralized. There's no, you know, centralized power that operates over it, but everything else does have some centralization where they have real life developers where they're coming in for a specific use case. So it's really, it's really, um, you have to kind of look at it like the team, who's the team behind it, who's, what's the adoption of it, um, you know, what's the actual use cases for it, and um, how quickly, you know, as far as the coin metrics, um, what's going in behind it. So the one great thing about blockchain is like you can audit the actual blockchain behind anything at any time you want. You can in real life, real, real time, go and see how many transactions are really happening here? How many people are actually using it? How many wallets are holding it? So like the, the amount of data is it far exceeds what you could do, you know, if you're a venture cap firm and you're waiting on somebody else to, you know, send their data to you, right? As far as the auditing, you can have real, real time auditing. So we're able to see behind the scenes and, you know, the training on how to do that obviously takes a ton of time. So I think that for most investors, you know, just like with the real estate, you've got to determine whether or not you want to be an operator or you want to be an investor. Mm -hmm. Right. And so, you know, I think that for most people, um, they're, they would, they're the expert at what they do. And then they're looking for experts to align with, you know, to become the investor, you know? And so in that case, that's why we do what we do. Right. So, you know, you mentioned this is time to plug yourself. Well, I mean, that's why we do what we do. So, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll call it out shameless plug, but that's why we structured the way we structured, you know, our structure is to allow people to gain exposure into an actively managed index of the markets. And so, you know, it's our team who's running the, the on-chain data, who's actually researching all these teams, who's, who's moving product around, who's actually, you know, identifying, you know, key products to hold, what not to hold, you know, things like that. Sorry, did you guys um, create the, the index? Correct. Oh, wow, yeah. that's cool. Yeah, so it, it, I mean, everything is proprietary into what we're actually doing. So it's our team who's studying these metrics. We have core holdings, and then we allow the data to just dictate you know, what it is, you know, we're not emotionally vested behind any of these products, you know, we can, we can actually move and, you know, rechange allocation, the liquidity is there and it's strong. Um, you know, I'll tell you, you know, as far as going back, the actual team, the management team um, in 2020 did net return to investors of uh, 312%. And then <laughs> last year was 166. So <laughs> we just opened up Wow. A separate fund inside that. But that doesn't mean that there's not months that are up and down. 
Absolutely. So, you know, I think people have to really be aware of the volatility. They have to know they're, they're, they're bringing on risk, but at the same time, this is a market that continues to grow. The adoption is growing at an alarming rate. I mean, I don't know if you guys saw the executive order from President Biden the other day. It basically said that he wants the U.S. to become leading and far lead, uh, you know, leader in the technology space to include cryptocurrencies. And so they're going to be looking at, you know, uh, how to bring more protection to investors, how to how to actually, you know, utilize this as a country. And um, you know, I I applaud them for doing that because I think that um, you know this is definitely a technological race. And then obviously with different things going on around the world, you can see um, the vine for power. So anyways, whole nother topic there. But um, yeah, if somebody wants to, wants to learn, it takes a lot of hours. I mean, you could spend 100, 100 hours just on Bitcoin alone, and um, you're, you're still going to be scratching the surface. And But what I will tell you is, I don't know anybody that's studied Bitcoin for more than 100 hours that isn't absolutely in love with it. That doesn't. So I'm fascinated by it, but my understanding of it hasn't um, but it hasn't formed yet. Can mm -hmm. you, there's so much you said there that I want to understand more of, but the, the thing that I really truly don't understand is, is the basis for value in that Bitcoin. I, I'm sorry, I'm air quoting, but um, sure. <laughs> because a Bitcoin isn't a real thing. It's not like real estate where you can go touch it. That's my understanding. Yeah. So, um, but it is 100%, you know, unmutable. It's not hackable. I mean, it is identifiable specifically through this actual, actual digital blockchain. So you can identify what you own specifically, right? That, that is 100% verifiable. So then as far as like, well, what if somebody takes it theft? Well, these, like whenever you were bringing up like the different wallets and exchanges and things like that, these are all, you know, exchanges is obviously just somewhere where you can purchase it. And then you could actually hold it there. Wallets are things where you store it. So there's obviously storage concerns. There's purchasing concerns, uh, things like that of where and how you would actually hedge that as from a security perspective. Um, but as far as like what it is and its use cases, you know, the broader blockchain technology is a way to undergird digital transactions in a way that makes everything verifiable and requires no trust or third party authentication because the blockchain itself can authenticate and verify everything that's taking place um, at any point in time. So, you know, for real estate people, I mean, think about a title company. Why do we use a title company? It's a third party to implement trust to maintain a transaction. So blockchain technology can do that without a title company. You could verify, you could do all your title work and have it 100% stored and instantly be able to pull it up. That's accessible records that cannot be tampered with and you'd be able to see title work of all the ownership, the entire chain of transaction history at any given time and transfer title from one owner to the new owner. Um, you know, I don't want to say instantly, but very quickly. And so, you know, the use cases are out there, you know, Bitcoin itself, you know, really, I think is a decentralized form of monetary power. And so, you know, I think that it could, it could do a lot of things, um, but that's its primary use right now. I think that as, as the bigger player in the market, you know, it really sits as sort of the market leader, but everything else with inside the market, you just have to understand that the market itself, it's just like saying a tech company, right? Well, well, I don't know about a tech company. Well, technology as a company, as, as an industry, you know, you've got all kinds of different things from, you know, we could say Tesla is a tech company. We could say Google, you know, Facebook, Amazon. Well, all of them serve a completely different market and a completely different use case. Mm -hmm. It's the same with inside crypto. There are specific companies that are seeking to solve particular problems utilizing blockchain technology. So the use cases are, you know, vary across the board. And, um, you know, like, you know, I was, I was looking at a company the other day that actually could settle payment structuring. So if you could imagine the, <laughs> the power of a company to essentially in real time distribute pay at any given moment, like, like actually payroll could take place where when somebody's logged in, you could pay them. I mean, they're, I mean, virtually by the minute. So like, as they're earning, their earnings could come in automatically by the minute, right? So eliminate every payroll company that's ever existed, eliminate any need for actual um, use of trust between uh, vendors. It's the same thing. The banking system, it's the same thing. You know, anything that is happening in some form of digital capacity where it needs a third party for verification, you could, you could plug in a form of blockchain technology that then can actually support and undergird that 
to remove the need for trust. So, so again, the applications, it, it'd be like, you know, you could dive in and spend hours and hours and hours. And um, I couldn't even name every application that every single, you know, company out there or crypto is trying to solve. But, um, you know, for us, we're really focused right now on, you know, you know, Bitcoin itself, strong layer ones and some, some other things. And layer ones, what that means is, you know, think of like, this is a software and it's not a blockchain technology, but I think like maybe a simple idea is you have the, you guys have iPhones? Mm-hmm. Yes. Jonathan? I do not know. <laughs> He's like, no, okay, we don't need to get into the Android uh, iPhone. Yeah, yeah. Okay, but it's I, the same I, concept, I, regardless of what phone you have. Um, they have an underlying software, right? So Apple has the iOS system. Yeah. And then you have companies, you know, you guys, I mean, you might have anywhere from 10 to 100 apps on your phone. And every one of those apps or applications is an individual company ser serving a specific use. And they're building their company formatted on top of the iOS system or the Android system, right? So think like the Android system in this uh, or the iPhone system in this case would be like a layer one where it's an underlying infrastructure on which tons of other businesses can be built and operate. So it's the okay. same thing. You have layer one technologies inside blockchain, uh, the blockchain greater cryptocurrency world, that then you have tons of other companies that are building on. And so obviously the value of that underlying technology grows significantly every time you have additional users because the layer two people are, are bringing, you know, hundreds of thousands to millions of users, you know, through their platform when you had hundreds of them or thousands of those, you know, so, you have infinite scale there that's building on top of these applications. These ap applications are, you know, virtually, you know, if, if you think the world's going more digital, I can promise you the world's going to need more digital uh, support and security. And that's really where a lot of these fall in. So, you know, if you agree with that underlying thesis, then I would say that you in, in, in term, you know, have support or at least should dive into the education of the actual market itself. So then you guys are investing in the companies that are producing the technology. You're not investing in Bitcoin specific. Um, no, so we will actually hold the coin. So, so the, the, the actual currency itself that, that is tied to those companies. So you have developers and things like that, that are operating inside these. So we gain exposure through the actual cryptocurrency itself. So yes, we do own Bitcoin and, you know, a handful of other projects. And then, you know, we have, you know, a section of what are more of our longer term holds. And then we have a portion of the portfolio that we're more actively managing and then trading and hedging and things like that. Okay. Okay. Now I'm getting, so it's almost like, a, well, it's almost like what people do, but on a much more professional scale when they're talking like on Instagram and stuff about Bitcoin or uh, uh, cryptocurrency trading, but you guys are obviously doing it in a much more sophisticated and man well-managed way. Um, I, I'm, I'm not hundred percent sure what you're referencing, so I can't say yes or no, but, but yes, the idea is to create an index of what we deem to be great projects so that you know a single investor can gain exposure into the market. And then with that, not only do you have some diversification of projects and actual application types within inside that industry, but then you know, we have a portion of it that we are actively managing. We're managing all the allocation, we're managing you know, which projects we're investing into, which currencies we're investing into. And then um, you know, we will you know, actively hedge. So you know, back uh, a couple months ago, we felt like the market was due for pullback. We moved a big portion into cash and then the market did pull back. So then we're sitting with more cash, which then allows us to begin, start averaging and you know, putting capital back to work at lower prices as we feel like the markets are, you know, reaching bottom, bottom support and things like that. So, um, so yes, it is. That's why we say actively managed. And then when I refer to index, it's that, you know, it's a portfolio of different projects within inside um, the actual uh, cryptocurrency blockchain world so that, we have diversification of the actual portfolio itself as well. So, so just, just one thing, and this is, I mean, correct me if I've got my understanding wrong here, but what I saw happening, it was probably about five years ago where I saw a lot of it happening, where, where I guess a lot of companies would go for what they called their ICO as opposed to an IPO. Mm -hmm. And sure. effectively, effectively, it became that that was their means to gain money for the company. As you say, the company being a project of some sort, and effectively, that's where you really had to navigate and say, is this a company that is, was there a true company backing it up where, where as they do what they say they're going to do, revenue comes in and effectively that brings the value of the coin up. So that's effectively where the value in a lot of the coins is. Is that, is that a wrong understanding? Or is um, that yeah, my understanding of what you just shared was that um, you have underlying companies that are behind these projects. These projects are taken to market. 
And then based off of market response, adoption, utilization, uh, the projects will then grow in value. Is that, does that accurately describe it, what you shared? It, exactly. And, and, as, and as the project or company grows in value, effectively, that's where, where an investor would see their increase was that coin would grow in value because there's an actual, call it company backing it up. So it's, it sort of is like an alternative form of a stock market, but so, in some so yeah, ways. Yeah, I think that, um, yes. And um, I, a lot of the differences just come down to what it is you're looking at and what you believe in and where you want to put your money, right? So as far as a, an underlying operational standpoint, there are similarities in the way that these exchanges work, the purchasing of it works, uh, the way that the companies go to market and things like that, yes. I'm, uh, I'm still completely flabbergasted by what you're talking about with the payroll companies and employees being paid by the second. Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> there's, there's some wild things that, that, that can be done with this, yeah. Well, that to me, like that throws out the entire that it's a revolution uh, of epic proportions to the entire financial world to think about all of the applications like, uh, you know, I just sorry, my mind's been wandering since you said that, by the way. <laughs> yeah. yeah, so th th that's and that's one that's one thing, you know, so it, it's it's a it's a it's a yeah, when 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 like the people that are on this side of the coin, like I said, I don't know anybody that studied Bitcoin for over 100 hours that has anything negative to say. Right. Yeah. So, so, so yeah, the applications are wild. So like, just, just like take Bitcoin, for example, like imagine that anybody anywhere in the world, if they've got access to a cell phone, they have access to a financial instrument that allows them to trade, um, allows them to make payments, allows them to process without any third party um, stopping what they're doing. Right. So you have billions of people around the world that don't have access to a bank. Right. So like we, like we as a company, I mean, we support certain ministries, right? So like I personally sent money to a ministry in India um, here recently and I did it, you know, I had to go through Western Union because that's all they had access to. Mm -hmm. And this, 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 the guy who's having to pick up the money, he's having to travel a day just to get access to it because he has to go through Western Union. And then he's got to pick up the money. I mean, typically Western Union is taking out, you know, a chunk of fees, right? And then he's got to travel a day back. With a bunch of cash on him. Mm -hmm. But he has a cell phone. So if we can get him set up with actual access to an exchange, we could send this financial instrument to him directly at any point in the world, at any time, with no exchange getting in the way. I mean, how? I mean, everybody sent wires, right? Anybody listening to this who sent a wire, I mean, tell me it hasn't got more stringent. Where are you sending it to? Why are you sending it? How come you're sending this much? You know, miss your ID. If you want international, yeah. right? And so with this system, you can't, I mean, it eliminates, you know, anybody's control over your actual finances. So, you know. So how much does FINRA have to do with what you do then? So we, we were overseen by the SEC and then Commodities Trading Commission. Okay. So, so right now, you know, essentially a huge amount of actual crypto hasn't actually been deemed one way or the other, security or commodity. But right now, uh, Bitcoin has been deemed a non-security and so is Ethereum. I mean, that could, it could change, right? So like we operate as if it's both and our record keeping Smart. as if it's both, right? <laughs> because we believe that at any point it could change. And so, yes, it is, it is regulated, it is looked at, and we have to file all the appropriate filings with all the appropriate commissions to make sure that we're doing everything the right way. So, you know, we operate as such, even though some of it presently is out, outside of the, probably right now what you'd consider gray, right? Everybody says there's black, there's white, and there's gray. Well, we don't like gray. <laughs> we just try to operate as if it's exactly, you know, assume, assume that it's going to go one direction and then just operate as such. Well, I think a, a major concern for a lot of governmental agencies uh, is the money laundering ability of nefarious parties mm -hmm. how how prevalent is that in the crypto world so interestingly enough if you process the fact that every transaction is on the blockchain you can actually identify every single transaction that's ever taken place so most recently the fbi actually recovered what equated to about three and a half billion dollar recovery uh, by utilizing the ledger 
on the blockchain. They were able to track it down to see where it went because everything is a verifiable wallet. So, you know, I think that that may have happened 10 years ago, you know, back when nobody understood how this money was moving. But the reality is this could eliminate that, right? I'll just tell you, I think, I think the central bank will eventually have a central bank backed digital currency, right? I think they'll create their own. I, um, I think that for, for their reasons, um, it's, it's great for what they want to do. I don't think it's necessarily ideal for everyday citizens because then they have 100% power over everything you spend and they know every transaction uh, that you took place, right? They could take their taxes immediately without your consent, right? <laughs> They'd have access to everything, but, but that's a, that's a, I also want to move to Texas, just so you know. Uh, <laughs> yeah. so, but we have talked about that, haven't we, Jonathan? <laughs> come on, man. I think, I mean, there's right now the, the support in Texas for crypto is, is, is extremely strong. Same thing uh, with Florida. And uh, you've got a, a good handful of other states that are coming out and putting up like uh, state bills that are, that are wanting to introduce it more, uh, more into, at the state level, right? Because if they're like, if the federal government's not going to do it, we'll, we want to do it at the state level. So what I would say is, I think that that's kind of, you know, an old tale at this point of, you know, it's for criminal uses, it's nefarious and things like that, because the reality is, if you understand it, you understand it's trackable and you can actually see transactions. They could see what was sent from where to where. And so, you know, even like I said, even recently it was utilized for uh, the recovery, right? But if that was moved in cash, you would have never found it. So I'll just tell you, I mean, I think we could probably all agree that uh, the amount of illegal activity that happens in cash is probably significantly higher than anything happening uh, with crypto. So <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Any drug I mean, listen, listen, like, no. like, like if we're going to apply, if we're going to apply something, let's apply it on both sides of the, you know, let's just, let's just be, let's just be real about, about what has happened. So. Hey, Mandy, you take Bitcoin. Uh, now, this is fascinating to me. Um, it, it's something that I have not taken the time to study. And anytime that somebody asks my opinion on it, I, that's my answer. Um, but I do think it has the, the power to, to revolutionize the world. I mean, we're already moving to, towards digital currency. I don't carry cash ever. We've all done that. But not having to use a bank and pay your banking fees and um, waiting for checks to clear, stuff like that, like that's life changing at the at the the, the base level for people, the grassroots level. Yeah. And so I think that, I think that, you know, you, you're, there's always going to be a balance. I mean, do I think that the banking system will ever be eliminated? I mean, probably not anytime soon um, because, you know, I think that people like to outsource their security mm -hmm. and their responsibility and the banking system does that for them. You know, they feel more protected, more secure. And so, you know, even part of like the executive order is for banks to start looking into how banks can more uh, aptly um, hold and uh, store digital currency. So I think we'll end up seeing the banking system make a transition to be able to be crypto friendly. And then you'll probably end up seeing people storing their crypto with the bank, which, you know, I think a lot of your, your, your diehards are like, no, don't do that, you know, but at the same time, I think it's the reality of how, um, you know, people are going to, are going to operate, right? So, you know, my background in security, right? Uh, I mean, I was trained both physical security, and electronic security systems. So like when people are asking me, well, is it safe? I'm like, well, s s safe, from a security perspective, they're like, well, do I need to hold it in cold storage? Or do I need to like, you know, get it off the exchange? What I do? I'm like, well, your considerations are different. Like, what are you trying to do with it? Like one side, you have electronic security risks that have to be assessed and managed. And the other side, you have physical security risks that have to be assessed and managed, you know? And so, you know, I think that what you'll see is you'll see, you know, more, more banks and things like that, that are extremely crypto friendly. And they're already out there. I mean, there are banks that, you know, have been um, intricately involved for many years, right? And that's essentially the way they've transitioned. Um, so how do people invest with you through this? Uh, uh, sorry, invest through you into your index? Yeah, so so we don't, we don't do individually managed accounts or anything like that. This is an actual hedge fund. So our filing is what's called a five, uh, Regulation D 506C. So it's for accredited investors only. You've probably okay. seen these used for real estate deals. Mm -hmm. Right. So it's the same actual registration on an SEC level, you know, for our, our real estate fund. And so the operations and registrations happen the same. It's just the, it's just the, the actual you know, strategy underlying assets and, and the actual offering itself is different. So like if somebody was interested in investing, you know, um, in any case, it, you know, number one, just get in contact with us. And it's the same as, you know, the investment experience that you've probably experienced with, you know, if you've done a hedge fund investment or any type of, you know, private placement before is, you know, there's obviously, you know, them getting access to all the offering documents, understanding what it, what it is, visiting, understanding, you know, what the strategy is, who's operating, things like that. 
And then from there, you know, we have to go through, you know, AML, KYC, everything like that. You know, we have a third party fund administrator um, that, you know, does the back end of that. So they meet with us once they deem that they're interested and they want to move forward. Obviously, there's a funding process. They're then um, investing either from cash or we actually can accept Bitcoin, Ethereum or USDC, which are, you know, three different types of, you know, cryptocurrencies. Uh, so if somebody hasn't like already has Bitcoin holdings and they're like, you know, I bought a hundred of these things back five years ago and I've just been hanging on to it and not really sure what I want to do with it. Well, we have a lot of people who will just roll that over where it becomes actively managed. And when they do roll it over, they keep it in kind. And so they don't actually, uh, they don't actually incur a taxable event by the rollover because it stays in kind. Mm -hmm. So they're able to, they don't have to, you know, they don't have to convert it into cash and sell and then pay capital gains. They can actually roll over in kind, maintain their tax basis. So we got a lot of people that do that. And then, um, yeah. And then from there, it's pretty simple. I mean, like I said, we have a third party fund administrator, then we have to do, you know, annual audits on the, on, on the fund itself. And then, um, you know, from there, we obviously are managing the fund and then they have an ownership percentage in the fund. And then on a monthly basis, they're getting uh, reported statements, private investor portal, everything like that. So they can see everything coming, coming through. So when you uh, say a credit, you guys do institutional as well? Correct. Yeah. Okay. Just interested. Um, there's definitely probably an opportunity for us to do some business. We'll talk after the, the, <laughs> <laughs> the podcast. Um, so let's, uh, let's go back to where we started right in the beginning, that uh, hey. marketing award. I want to know about this. <laughs> what, what do you want to know? What do you want to uh, know? Well, it, it, you said eight figures online? Correct. And, and, and listen, this is just related to the operational system. Um, are you guys, have you heard of the company ClickFunnels? Yes. Okay, so in ClickFunnels, um, we we've gotten to know them very well, and so we'll we'll we've built out systems with inside the ClickFunnels framework to help with the investor experience, to help you know um, allow them to you know come into you know an investor event, and then we're obviously introducing investments to them and things like that. So that has to do primarily with actual capital raised, yeah. That's no, that's really cool. I'm a, I'm a giant marketing nerd. Uh, okay. <laughs> I, awesome. I, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I I wrote a book on it and all that stuff because we, sorry, I I totally nerd out on marketing. Uh, love the idea of being able to attract people online. I I'm a member of the was I love marketing. Dean Jackson and Joe Polish and they they work with all the Salesforce guys and just love yeah. it. <laughs> yeah, it's fascinating sure. to me. It's fascinating. And just be able to, uh, I mean, it's, it comes down to psychology, I believe at the end of the day is what, what are people actually thinking? It gets you out of your own head into somebody else's. Yeah. You know, and that, that's a, that's a, I think that that's a good study for anybody, right? No matter what, what it is you're doing, any of your relationships, whether it's, you know, even in business, right. Is understanding, um, being a good listener mm -hmm. and then understanding what it is people are looking for, what they're wanting and uh, how to best serve them. So, you know, Zach, who I, are you uh, looking for? Oh, sorry, go ahead. I was going to say, I, I enjoy that as well. So we could probably nerd out on that a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Um, yeah, no, I, I I love teaching people how to set up their own funnel because there's ways to do it for next to nothing. And then there's ways to go with ClickFunnel and get them to set it up. And all of it works basically the same. It's just a matter of what you, you have to commit to it. And everybody has the ability to do it if mm -hmm. they just spend the time. It's not that hard. Yeah. Uh, um, but before we get too far off topic with that, cause this is not a marketing podcast, uh, <laughs> but maybe we'll have you back on for the other one. Hey, Jonathan. Hmm. Yeah, that could be Future very guest. good. Talk to the marketing side. Yeah. <laughs> um, Zach, who are you looking for and how do they find you? Yeah. So we have a mix. So it, again, I'd say our, we primarily work with high net worth individuals, but also, you know, um, we've got family office and, and, and institution. And, you know, the best way really to get a hold of us, obviously you can go to the website, it's boroncap.com, B-O-R-O-N-C-A-P.com. Um, but I'd say the simplest and most direct way is uh, a tech service. And this is not an automated service. It goes directly to me. So I'll be the one answering it. And um, you just text the word info, I-N-F-O, to the number 
877-771-0615. So just text info to 877-771-0615. That then comes to me. It will send you a message right away, you know, just to get connected. And then it goes to my inbox and then we can correspond from there. But don't call that number. It is a text number, right? <laughs> so you'll actually need to text it. And then from there, you know, we can discuss more about what you're interested in looking at, whether that's, you know, the real estate side, the crypto side, or, you know, something from there. Yeah, I'm fascinated by all of it. We definitely want to talk to you again if you're uh, you're up for another visit. This has been totally, I didn't expect us to go down the cryptocurrency trail, but it's it's something that, uh, I mean, if you're not educated on it yet, you're going to need to be in the future. So 100%, 100%. Thanks so much for that, Zach. Sorry, is there anything you want to say before we uh, wrap it up? No, not at all. I, I appreciate you guys having me. Um, I just agree with your last statement, you know, and, and listen, you know, I think that, um, I think that everybody should have really strong beliefs loosely held. Um, mm -hmm. You have to let the data do the talking. And, you know, we were, we were of the position that it wasn't an investable asset X amount of years ago. And then now we feel like um, the environment has changed. And so we made that change and uh, made that adaptation, right? And you're seeing it. And for those who don't know, I mean, it's happening at, at all levels of institutions right now, the amount of interest and uh, money trying to come into this market um, is, is extremely high. And so I think that, um, now is it an incredible time to really grow in your education at a minimum. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much for your time, Zach. We really appreciate it. Jonathan, as always, thank you for your uh, insights and, and ability to, uh, to keep us going there. Um, I, I know you're as fascinated by this as I am, so I, I'm sure we're going to be talking about it for the next hour. <laughs> I want to know more complete, about it. Completely the case. <laughs> thank you so much, Zach, for coming on. This has been fascinating. I, well, I'm, yeah. You're welcome. Appreciate you guys both. And thank you for listening. If you want to get a hold of us, you can certainly, sh certainly shoot us an email at ipincome at mortgageplan.com, or you can find us on Spotify, uh, Google Play, all of those things more, uh, for more episodes of this. Gentlemen, thank you very much for your time. Appreciate it. Thank you for listening. Have a fantastic day, and we'll see you soon.